Hello and welcome to this lecture on motivation. Motivation is an internal state that can be adversely or positively affected by dispositional characteristics, influences of others, and influences from situations and environments. All of these are important for managers to understand because the last two categories can be manipulated or changed. The first category, dispositions, is also important to understand, but the malleability of personality, values, and beliefs is a little harder to change, at least by other people, that is. Theories of motivation can be categorized as reinforcement or learning theories, like the rat in the maze on this slide, needs theories, or process theories. We need to realize that no single theory of motivation explains everything, every time, about human motivation. Sometimes two or more theories can explain bits and pieces of human motivation at the same time. We're, not, we're just not sure exactly what drives all humans all the time. In this lecture video, we will explore only three of the great number of theories about motivation. These three have been validated the most in the world of management and organizational psychology research. Let's get started. Organizational behavior modification is sometimes referred to by its acronym OBM. It is also known as reinforcement theory. On the introduction slide of this video, you saw a picture of a rat in a maze. To some extent, we are all rats in a maze. We won't run the maze, that is, do the job, if we can't find the cheese, that is, get paid. It's the simplest and most basic theory of motivation that exists. There are some key terms to know before we dig deeper into this very valid theory. First is the concept of an antecedent. An antecedent is an event that precedes a behavior. It's not a cause of behavior. It can be a cue of behavior, though. Second is the concept of a consequence. This is what follows a behavior, and it influences future behaviors. If we apply the right consequences, we can get people to do or not to do a lot of things. Third is the concept of a contingency. This type of consequence that occurs with the hopes of influencing future behaviors. If we apply the correct contingency, we are likely to be more successful than if we don't. Fourth is the concept of a reinforcement schedule. This is the issue of exactly when do we apply the consequence. This has a huge impact on future behavior as well. On the next two slides, we will look at contingencies and schedules in depth. Here's a word to the wise. Every consequence has both a contingency and a schedule. That is, every consequence is comprised of what sort of type of consequence is applied and when it's applied. Let's move on. Reinforcement theory grew out of the work of Watson and Skinner and suggests that organisms are motivated to engage in behaviors that result in rewards and to avoid behaviors that result in punishment. Well, there's certainly a lot of validity there. Few, as, few of us would show up to work day after day if we did not get paid. Even fewer of us would show up to work every day if we were punished simply for showing up. However, reinforcement theory is a little bit more complicated than just reward and punishment. Let's take a closer look. First, we'll talk about positive reinforcement. And this involves introducing a consequence that results in a certain behavior being increased or maintained. The consequence is usually our reward. So when we introduce a reward, we're increasing or at least maintaining desirable behavior. The classic example is giving a child a cookie for putting away his toys. If the child puts away the toys, which is a desirable behavior, then they get a cookie. So that's the reward, and that's technically positive reinforcement. The opposite of positive reinforcement is punishment, which involves introducing a consequence that decreases behavior. Here we're talking about real punishments, such as losing a bonus for missing work or a child being grounded for a week for coming in too late one night. If the child comes home late at night past the curfew, the consequence then introduced is punishment. The punishment is, say, being grounded, being prohibited from leaving the house for a certain period of time. When that punishment is established, then hopefully, of course, 
the parents out there will probably admit that the behavior then decreases, that is, the child comes home on time. Well, in the world of work, we can take away bonuses, we can dock pay, we can send people home, we can write them up as part of their so-called permanent record. We can do all sorts of things to punish employees with the desire of decreasing undesirable behavior from the employees. Next, we have the consequence of extinction. Extinction is an interesting way of decreasing behavior. What we do there with extinction is simply not apply any consequence at all. We can extinguish behavior that is undesirable by simply not recognizing it. For example, in the college classroom, sometimes there's one student in the front row always raising their hand, wiggling in their seat. Oh, 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 oh call on me, call on me, call on me. And if that student really adds very little to the discussion with their comments when called upon, the professor may simply ignore them. And if you ignore the student in the front row raising his hand long enough, then him waving and flailing his hand, which is usually an undesirable behavior, will decrease by simply not recognizing the student. So we can extinguish certain undesirable behaviors by simply not recognizing them. That is by not rewarding them or by punishing them. If we want to decrease that behavior, we can extinguish it by providing no consequence to the behavior whatsoever. The fourth type of reinforcement contingency is negative reinforcement. This one is rather hard to implement. It is not the opposite of positive reinforcement. As we now know, the opposite of positive reinforcement is punishment. Negative reinforcement is when we remove a consequence which then results in an increase in desirable behaviors. Okay, so it's sort of hard to implement that in the world of work. Maybe a manager can criticize a tardy employee in staff meetings every single day, and then one day the employee stops showing up late to work, so the criticism stops. The negative consequence is implemented every single day until the undesirable behavior stops. Some people might even think of a, the charitable, charitable group out in front of the department stores during the Christmas sing, uh, season, ringing the bell furiously over the holiday seasons for their donations. Some people may interpret that ringing of the bell as a negative consequence. And if they walk on by, then the ringing continues. From the bell ringer's point of view, ignoring the opportunity to make a donation is an undesirable behavior. From the person walking by, the only way to make them stop ringing the bell is to put money in the kettle. Often, automobile manufacturers have implemented this. When you get into your car, you have that annoying buzzing sound until you buckle up your seatbelt. So, when you have that negative consequence, then you can encourage desirable behaviors and the only way to stop the negative consequence is to therefore then actually engage in the desirable behavior. As you might imagine, this is really hard to implement in the world of work. It's not done very often and it's rarely done well. Most commonly in the world of work, we think of positive reinforcement and punishment and sometimes extinction. Let's move on. Well, when and how often we apply rewards and punishment actually matters. And it can be divided into continuous and intermittent categories. And the intermittent categories have four subcategories, and we'll get to them in a minute. So let's explore continuous reinforcement. Here we have positive reinforcement after every single occurrence of the desired behavior. So the classic example of this is piece rate compensation where an assembly line worker is paid a nickel or whatever for every single widget that they make. When they don't make a widget, they don't get paid. When they make a widget, they get paid. They're paid by the number of successful desirable behaviors. If they make a million widgets in a day, they get paid a million nickels. If they make five widgets in a day, they make five wi uh, nickels. And so you're paid by the number of behaviors, not the amount of time that passes. It's reinforcement after every single occurrence. And this is actually quite effective at learning new tasks. So when we're teaching someone how to do something, every time they do it well, they get paid. Every occurrence of successful performance gets a reward or a positive reinforcement. 
Well, let's explore the various types of intermittent reinforcement schedules as well. And so first we have the fixed ratio type of intermittent reinforcement. This is reinforcement after a fixed number of behaviors or accomplishments. So maybe on the assembly line, you get paid after every 10th widget, who knows? Maybe a better example would be in automobile sales in which you're allowed to go home for the rest of the day after selling, say, two cars. If you sell two cars in the first hour, you get the rest of the day off. If you sell two cars in the sixth hour, you work six hours and then you go home. If it takes you 10 hours to sell two cars, then you're there for 10 hours and you do not go home until you sell those cars. So here we're again talking about a specific number of behaviors, not an amount of time. Now the ratio, the variable ratio is slightly different. Here behavior is reinforced after a variable number of times. So you don't get a reward or a positive reinforcement technically after the sale of every two cars. What you get is a reward after some varying number of behaviors. And the classic example there is telemarketing where a salesperson makes a sale, earns a commission in effect after every six or sometimes eight or sometimes 20 or sometimes 47 cold calls. The number of behaviors, the number of calls varies greatly between the receipt of positive reinforcements there. So continuous fixed ratio and variable ratio are when we apply reinforcement after a certain number of behaviors. Well, this is slightly different than the other two types of intermittent reinforcement. We have fixed interval reinforcement. Well, here we receive reinforcement after a fixed period of time or interval we get some compensation after a very specific amount of time. Well, what's the classic example of that? The paycheck. Employees get paid every two weeks or they get paid twice a month or they get paid once a month, but on a very specific amount of fixed time, they get paid. Now that's slightly different than variable interval. Variable interval reinforcement is when employees receive reinforcement after various lengths of time. Well, as you might surmise, this is sort of hard to implement in the world of work. I mean, if, if people were unsure when their paycheck was going to come, <laughs> they probably wouldn't do the job very long. That could be kind of demotivating. And ideally, we want to motivate people. So one good example is promotions. Not everybody gets promoted at exactly the same time or after the exact same amount of passing time. So one employee may get a promotion within six months, but another employee may not get their first promotion for two years. Or the first employee gets their first promotion in six months, their next at five years, their next promotion three months after that, and their next promotion 10 years after that. So here, the varying amount of time is what makes this an intermittent schedule of reinforcement. Now let's be clear and think about this. Schedules of reinforcement and contingencies of reinforcement apply to everything. So for the same sort of contingency, maybe it's positive reinforcement, there can be one of five different schedules. And for the same sort of schedule or reinforcement, there can be multiple forms of contingency. So in this slide, we talked really about applying rewards, that is positive reinforcement, but this could also be flipped around. We can also apply punishment in the same manner. So there's a fixed ratio punishment. There's a variable ratio punishment, a continuous punishment. Think about taxes on consumption of certain goods. If there's a tax on every single cigarette that you purchase, that's a continuous schedule of reinforcement with a punishment contingency of reinforcement. Every time you buy a cigarette, let's say they're sold by the single, you pay some money to the government. That's not usually viewed as a desirable thing. Paying taxes is often seen as punishment. So every single schedule can apply to all of the different contingencies and all of the different contingencies can be implemented according to each of the five different schedules. So this is a whole lot more than just rats running in a maze, looking for the cheese at the end of the maze, which is where some of this research really started. So in a certain sense, employees kind of are, but kind of are not rats in a maze. Very few of us, that is, would go to work if we didn't get that cheese at the end of the month. 
We run through the maze of our work life so that we can get the reward. So there is some application to this, but it really kind of takes out of the equation the whole concept of mental processes and thinking. And most human behaviors are certainly higher order beings than most rat behaviors. So we can see how it might take a bit more to explain how it is that human beings learn things. That is, how it is that reinforcement can actually be applied as a theory of motivation for humans. Let's move on. Expectancy theory is a process theory that attempts to explain the decision processes involved in individual motivation. We are thinking beings after all. Because motivation is a process that governs choices between alternative forms of voluntary activity, most behaviors are under the voluntary control of us and are therefore a result of some motivation. So we engage in behaviors for which we are most motivated. We tend not to do things for which we are not motivated. Let's learn a few key terms first. Expectancy is the probability of something occurring because of a behavior. So here we're talking about the relationship between effort and performance, and also about the relationship between performance and first level outcomes. Now bear in mind, there is a difference between job performance and performance scores or performance review. High quality job performance can be expected to produce a favorable performance score. Not always, but the linkage is clear that performance leads to performance appraisal scores. First level outcomes are instrumental rewards or outcomes. That is, they are instrumental in the achievement of second level outcomes which are the terminal goal or terminal value that we truly desire to have. This terminal goal or terminal value is known as a second level outcome. And it might be a promotion or a merit pay increase or simply acceptance by the group. Second level outcomes are the end goal. Instrumentality is the perception that the first level outcomes are associated with the second level outcomes. This is sort of a probability thing. How likely is it that one of the first level outcomes will lead to the second level outcome? In the case of quality effort being expected to result in quality performance, that is expected to result in a favorable performance review that is instrumental in getting a raise or a promotion. Valence is the preference by the individual for certain outcomes. It's the value that we place on individual first level and second level outcomes. Clearly, we value some things more than others. That is, we value some first level outcomes more than each other. We also value second level outcomes more than any of the first level outcomes. This will be much easier to understand if we look at it in the form of a diagram. So let's move on. Here we have the expectancy theory model. And this suggests that we expend effort towards performance. When we perform well, we expect any of several first level outcomes. These first level outcomes are instrumental to the accomplishment of some second level outcome. In this version of the model, there is only one second level outcome, which is the end goal. For example, suppose your end goal is winning the award for employee of the year. You know about the end goal before you even begin working towards it. It is the proverbial pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Having that in mind will help you decide how to get there. Well, how can you get there? Suppose that your employer makes the rules clear on this award. You know that to be employee of the year, you absolutely first must win employee of the month at least once in the year because only employees of the month are eligible for the award that you so covet. There could be 12 individual employees of the month or there could be only one if you or someone else wins all 12 or anywhere in between. So you decide to work extremely hard this year, this month, and every day in hopes of maximizing your chances of winning employee of the month at least once so you'll be eligible for the employee of the year. You think that if you try really, really, really hard and expend a lot of effort that you can perform the job better than anyone else. So your expectancy between effort and performance is very strong and positive. If your performance is exceptional, 
then you will be more likely to win one of the first level outcomes. In this model, they are Employee of the Month Award, a one-time spot bonus, and the third one is the admiration of your peers. These are your first level outcomes. However, we have to backtrack just a little bit. There are different expectancies between good performance and each of the three first level outcomes. Because the admiration of your peers is the easiest to achieve, it has the highest expectancy. We can definitely expect that it will occur if we perform well. The spot bonus is more rare and harder to achieve, so its expectancy is of moderate length, strength. After all, there's only so much money to go around, so spot bonuses are not awarded too frequently. Lastly, we have the Employee of the Month Award. There might be 200 or so employees where you work, so being the absolute best one some month is very hard to earn. We have a very low expectancy that it will occur given superior performance by you, but there's a chance. Now in review, the first level outcomes in this model would be Employee of the Month, Spot Bonus, and Admiration of Your Peers. Next is the question of which will be more instrumental in earning Employee of the Year. Clearly, winning Employee of the Month will likely be more instrumental in winning the Employee of the Year award than will winning a spot bonus or earning the admiration of your peers. In fact, the latter two won't even qualify you for the yearly award. So your energy will be expended most towards winning Employee of the Month. Now, this model shows that expectancy is the strength of the relationship between effort and performance and between performance and each of the first level outcomes. But instrumentality is the strength of the relationship between each first level outcome and the second level outcome. That is, how instrumental will the achievement of a first level outcome be in achieving the second level outcome? Well, you value those first level outcomes differently. Valence is how much we value all possible outcomes. The valence for winning Employee of the Year is the strongest. Because winning Employee of the Month is a requirement for the thing that we value the most, it has the next highest valence, followed in descending order by the spot bonus and then the admiration of your peers. The bonus and the admiration of your peers are both not nice outcomes and they're worth striving for, but let's not lose sight of the end goal. They won't get you Employee of the Year. Expectancy is a well-validated process model of motivation because we engage in cognitive processes regarding behaviors which we choose to exhibit. As higher order beings, we use our brains to make decisions about things that we should or should not pursue. This is vastly different than being a rat in a maze. Let's move on. Equity theory is a process theory about fairness that revolves around, revolves around social comparison. We use these processes to make comparisons about ourselves, our contributions and rewards of those of ourselves and of others. Equity theory is rooted in Leon Festinger's cognitive dissonance theory, which states that dissonance can be viewed as an antecedent condition leading to activity that is oriented towards dissonance reduction. That is, situations that make us uneasy or dissonant tend to motivate us to change the situation and make it more comfortable for us. At its rawest, dissonance is when our expectations do not match our experience. For example, we might expect that that new truck with the 8-inch lift kit will make us look super attractive on the romantic market, but when we buy it, we find that our experience is very different because many people see us as totally idi total idiots and undateable. That's dissonance. So that's because our experience did not match our expectations. Equity theory is based upon perceptions, and it's important to study perceptions, even if they are indeed misperceptions. If it's a misperception, it can still influence our behavior. Some have even argued that there really is no such thing as a misperception, that it's just a different perception than others hold. There are some key terms in equity theory with which we must become familiar. An input is something brought by the person to the job. Outcomes are things that the person receives from the job. 
The comparison or referent other is a critical part of equity theory, and it is any person or group of persons used as a referent regarding the ratio of inputs and outcomes. It's someone to whom we refer or compare ourselves. Examples of inputs include effort, education, experience, ability, special skills, etc. Examples of outcomes include things like pay, benefits, prestige, status, other things that we get from our job. Now, if this ratio of outcomes to inputs is compared to the same ratio of someone else, and if it's not equivalent, then anxiety is provoked. Equivalency is what is sought. Equivalency is not necessarily equality. We simply wish to make the ratio of outcomes to inputs similar to that of our referent others ratio. For example, if we make half as much money as someone else, but actually only work half as hard as they do, then that's fine. Our ratio of outcomes to inputs is equivalent to that other person. So just to recap, this is a theory of fairness based upon cognitive dissonance. It requires a referent other to whom we compare ourselves. When the comparison ratio is out of whack, so to speak, we get anxious and experience dissonance, so we must do something to reduce that dissonance. Let's move on. With equity theory, it is critical to identify whom we compare ourselves to. We call these special cases of equity theory. First, we have the notion of something called employee equity. This is when the comparison other is a member of the same organization as us and holds the same position as us. This is a logical comparison. For example, two intermediate accountants at the same company. Or, in a baseball example, two catchers on the same team. When one accountant compares their ratio of outcomes to inputs to the ratio of the other accountant, it's called employee equity. It's the same thing with two catchers on the same baseball team. These two examples are essentially same company, same job. This is the most common special case of equity theory. It's easier for us to compare ourselves to people who do our job and who work in the same company as us than to someone else. Internal equity is when the comparison other is a member of the same company as us, but holds a different position. This could be an accountant for a company comparing their outcome to input ratio to that of a financial analyst for the same firm. With the baseball example, it would be a catcher who chooses as a comparison other a pitcher on the same team. This is called internal equity. This is same company, different jobs. Sometimes, this is kind of like comparing apples to oranges. For example, how do you compare the outcome to input ratio of a software engineer to that of an outside salesperson? Even if they work for the same company, that's still sort of an odd comparison, but people do it. External equity is when the comparison other is a member of another organization, but holds a similar position as you do. This is when an accountant for one company compares their outcome to input ratio to an accountant at another company. In baseball, it's when the catcher compares their ratio on their team to the ratio of a catcher on another team. This is called external equity. This is different company, same job. One of the things that affects this comparison is that the jobs could be in different parts of the country or even different parts of the world with different cost of living. So in order to do external equity comparisons, we often turn to salary comparison websites that take into account this cost of living. These sites are quite abundant and a wise person should use it. Let's move on. Here are some tips for business practitioners to make the most of their knowledge about motivation. First, sometimes a reward can be free. The old pat on the back goes a long way. In the southern United States, it sometimes is accompanied with an attaboy. Attaboy! And you pat him on the back. In the Northeast, it's probably often accompanied with, way to go. In the UK, it might be coupled with, righto, old fellow. I apologize to my British friends for that last one. <laughs> I recommend that if you are giving someone praise for a job well done, 
do it in public so that others can see it. It is then likely to become a two-pronged reward. One prong is the pat on the back. The other prong is the admiration of one's peers. Plus, it's free. Second is that firms should be clear and transparent about pay. Pay secrecy is rarely a good idea, and some states have now recently outlawed it. Even if it is a so-called secret, it's not really a secret. And please talk. They find out who makes what. Nothing breeds animosity and contempt like secrecy and gossip. If your pay system is fair, there should be nothing to hide. Third, managers must make sure that role expectations are clear and promises are kept. They must make sure that employee goals are clearly understood. If someone is not sure what their job is supposed to entail or doesn't know what the performance goal of the job is, then there will be a breakdown in expectancy and instrumentality. Managers must make the path to excellence clear, crystal clear. Fourth, be fair even to a fault. If a manager sets up a reward or punishment system, then it must be implemented without regard for personal circumstances. Everybody wants to claim that everything is unfair. Most things that people claim are unfair are actually just unfortunate. Some things that people claim are unfair are actually just unreasonable. Few things should be unfair in the workplace. Here's an example. Suppose that if you're late to work more than three times in a month, then you get fired. It's the last week of the month and you have a flat tire on the way to work. You're late for the fourth time and you get fired. Is that unfair? No. It's just unfortunate that you had so many tardies earlier in the month that you had no slack in your personal tardy limit. Suppose that your manager has implemented a new sales quota. And in the written instructions at the very bottom, there's a phrase that reads in fine print. In order to be exempt from this quota, you just need to say the password to the manager. Everyone tells the manager the password except you. And you fail to meet the no new quota and you get fired. Is that unfair? No. Nope but it's highly unreasonable. The rules are stated at the beginning of the new procedure, but you didn't read them all. To round out the ex examples, suppose that you and your coworker are told that if you reach a certain sales quota, you will not be fired. The day before the end of the sales period, you are relieved because you met the quota. However, one hour before the sales period expires, the boss raises the quota to just below that which you achieved. That which was achieved by your colleague. Thus, because the quota was changed at the very last hour, you get fired, but your colleague keeps their job. Is that unfair? Yes. You can't change the rules of the game in the middle of the game. Good managers must work hard to minimize or eliminate unfairness on the job. Let's move on. Well, thanks. I hope you enjoyed this. See you next time.